So what we're looking at today is a comparison between Jonathan Demme's Silence of the Lambs with Linda Williams' work, written work, When a Woman Looks. How I'm going to navigate this essay is I'm going to talk about Linda Williams' points, and then I'll show a clip of the film, and the clip I'll be using is with sound. If I use clips without sound, that's not the actual example. I'm just preluding what I'm going to show. So there are three different outcomes that Williams points out that happens when a woman looks in a horror film. And it, it's, I'm going to make this um, the differentiation between the difference between a man and a male look in, in how Williams describes because it's important. And it's not just the basic conversation of, well, the man seems heroic, he's always um, the best hero, he's always right, and the, and the woman is, if she's mean, she's just bitchy, or uh, it's the Madonna horror complex. No, it's, it's it's really an interesting um, look into the use of cinematography and construction of the zeitgeist of what a woman means and what it means when we look at it in a film. So William says that there's two different kinds of women when it comes to horror films. The ones that will not look and the ones that do look. The woman who can't look is almost too pure, um, too well-trained and because she can't look she will not be punished for her vices. And the woman who looks she's inviting practically danger into her life. And the woman that looks it really just means that she's curious and it's not let's say oh it's you can use the example where a woman enters a very scary haunted house and she was curious and that led her to her untimely death or you could just use the example of a woman looking because maybe she cares about someone who's in pain. And that's the perfect segue into the first clip of Science of the Lambs that I'll be using. So I'm going to use the example of Catherine coming home in Science of the Lambs of the woman getting punished, which is outcome number one. She comes home to her apartment, she sees a guy who's a little handicapped, uh, needing some help. She looks twice, she thinks about it before helping him, I mean, it's a dark night. She can't help it, she has a heart, she wants to go help him. And uh oh for her. And what's intriguing here is not that Buffalo Bill has studied this girl. She knows what she likes and doesn't like and what she would help and not help. He really just relates his instincts on classic motherly, womanly instinct, which is to help. So here's the clip. Up right there. Can I help you with that? Would you? Sure. Thank you. That's all right. You look kind of handicapped. Yeah. I got it this far. I just can't get it up in the truck. So, yeah, just grab this. Oh. OK. Yeah, you can set it down. That's good. So, uh, get in the truck, and, and I want to push it all the way up. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, push it all the way there. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, that's great. Okay. Hey, see, are you about a size 14? Sorry. <laughs> Here's a quote from page 19, quote, The woman's exercise of an active investigating gaze can only be simultaneous with her own victimization. The woman's gaze is punished, in other words, by narrative processes that transform curiosity and desire into masochistic fantasy. Now, Williams describes that there is a consequence to looking, which is besides punishment, but is falling into a trance-like state for looking, which is outcome number two, the trance-like state. So I'm going to use an example which sort of ties the two of them both. We have Agent Starling, who is kind of barred from looking. She's put in a place with all the male cops. She's barred from kind of doing anything, even partaking in their conversation. She's kind of left alone. And they're at the funeral of a woman that was uh, recently murdered. And curiosity, her look, gets the best of her when she sees uh, slip through the door of the coffin and she goes to follow it. So 
here we have the punishment for looking and now in the translate state so when she is going towards the coffin she has well I will slide in that it was wonderfully directed um, these flashbacks to when her father passed away and and we show her what like it is shot in a close-up and we see her walking and her eyes are glossing over and we cut back and we never see the female who has passed away where she in reality is at the funeral instead we see her father and this translate state would you can say it's not because she's seen the monster but she's seen the work of the monster and this puts her at a disadvantage right you can say that perhaps she's too emotional to work here and this is why the male cops want to bar her from being here from overhearing conversations right now I sure this type of sex crime has certain aspects I just as soon discussed in private you know what I mean Quote from page 20, quote, For where the male voyeur's properly distant look safely masters the potential threat of the female body it views, the woman's look of horror paralyzes her in such a way that the distance is overcome. Quote. So here's another example from the film of Agent Starling falling into the trance-like state. She is here to examine the corpse of a recently killed woman by Buffalo Bill. And immediately as she turns around and looks at the body, she falls into trance. She says, Bill. And the gaze from the men around her show immediately that this is a normal place. She shouldn't be on this case, almost. And throughout the film, you see that a lot of times she's just being used as sort of bait. A bait to get answers from Hannibal Lecter and possibly even a bait from Buffalo Bill. Okay, Starling. Bill. Now, the third outcome is relatability to the monster. Is when the woman looks at the monster, she sort of sees herself. She sort of sees the pain that he's enduring. And I'm not talking about Buffalo Bill. I'm talking about Hannibal Lecter. Two quotes from Williams. First one coming from page 20. Quote, a surprising and at times subversive affinity between monster and woman in the sense in which her look at the monster recognizes their similar status within patriarchal structures of seeing. Quote. And the next one is from page 25. Quote. There is a sense in which the woman's look at the monster is more than simply a punishment for looking or a narcissistic fascination with the distortion of her own image in the mirror that patriarchy holds up to her. It is also recognition of their similar status as potent threats to a vulnerable male power. This would help explain the often vindictive destruction of the monster in the horror film and the fact that this destruction generates the frequent sympathy 
of the woman character. Quote, so bear with me because I'm going to use three clips to explain this point. The first one is where she looks around his cell and realizes his own artwork is missing. And she asks him, and immediately for a woman to sort of show the sort of compassion to this serial killer cannibal, they, they bloom a very interesting friendship. What happened to your drawings? Punishment, you see, for Migs. And what you can boil that feeling down to is the womanly instinct to care, right? Because she's never shown as a crazy, insane figure. She's a woman. She's a woman who really loves what she, do, what she does. And in this next scene I'm going to show, which is sort of the climax scene, when she's fighting for answers from him, and he wants back what's deep inside her and revealing that sort of moment that broke her, that made her grow overnight into a woman, creates this extremely, extremely tight bomb between the two of them of trust. No, he covets. That is his nature. And how do we begin to covet, Clarice? Do we seek out things to covet? Make an effort to answer now. No. We just... Now, we begin by coveting what we see every day. Don't you feel eyes moving over your body, Clarice? And don't your eyes seek out the things you want? All right, yes. Now, please tell me how. No. This is your turn to tell me, Clarice. You don't have any more vacations to sell. Why did you leave that ranch? Doctor, we don't have any more time for any of this now. But we don't reckon time the same way, do we, Clarice? This is all the time you'll ever have. Later, now please listen to me. We've only got five... No, I will listen now. After your father's murder, you were orphaned. You were 10 years old. You went to live with cousins on the sheep and horse ranch in Montana. And? And one morning, I just ran away. Not just, Clarice. What set you off? You started at what time? Early, still dark. Then something woke you, didn't it? Was it a dream? What was it? I heard a strange noise. What was it? It was... screaming. Some kind of screaming, like a child's voice. What did you do? I went downstairs, outside. I crept up into the barn. I was so scared to look inside, but I had to. What did you see, Clarice? What did you see? Lambs. They were screaming. They were slaughtering the spring lambs? And they were screaming. And you ran away? No. First, I tried to free them. I I opened the gate to their pen, but they wouldn't run. They just stood there, confused. They wouldn't run. But you could, and you did, didn't you? Yes. I took one lamb, and I ran away as fast as I could. Where were you going, Clarice? I don't know. I didn't have any food, any water, and it was very cold. Very cold. I thought... I thought if I could save just one, but... I didn't get more than a few miles when the sheriff's car picked me up. The rancher was so angry, he sent me to live at the Lutheran Orphanage in Postman. I never saw the ranch again. What became of your lamb, Clarice? They killed him. You still wake up sometimes, don't you? You wake up in the dark and hear the screaming of the lamb. Do you think if you save poor Catherine, you could make them stop, don't you? You think if Catherine lives, you won't wake up in the dark ever again to that awful screaming of the lamb? I don't know. I don't know. Thank you, Clarice. Thank you. Tell me. 
Tell me his name, Doctor. Dr. Chilton, I presume. I think you know each other. So she takes this information from him that no one else in the world could have gotten this out of him, but he comes to like her due to this relatability. And who does she take this information to? Who's the only other person that could understand this information about Buffalo Bill? Another woman, which is segue into this next clip. What did Lecter say about the first principles? Simplicity. What does this guy do? He covets. How do we first start to covet? We covet what we see every day. It's the women that understand the monster, or the two monsters, as you can say. Which makes me think of the quote, it takes one to know one. Makes you think, am I right or am I wrong, ladies? This is how I'm going to conclude today's essay. Thank you for listening and watching. Goodbye.